the Joint Center for Urban Mobility Research at Rice Center, a nonprofit research corporation affiliated with Rice University. Transportation Safety Institute of the U.S. Department of Transportation presents the STARTS Training Program, Special Transit and Rural Transit Safety. In this program, we'll look at vehicle safety inspections, the first step to successful and safe driving. Regional clearance delivery, American 278. Before any good airline pilot takes off, he runs through an extensive checklist to make sure, to the greatest degree possible, his aircraft is safe to fly. He knows that his own safety and the safety of his crew and passengers depend largely on the reliability of his equipment. And the best time to make sure all systems are go is before the airplane leaves the ground. Just like that pilot, you as a driver are the captain of your vehicle. Hi, I'm Nat Benchley and welcome to the STARTS training program. Today, we're at Jefferson Area United Transportation in Charlottesville, Virginia, to look at procedures for conducting pre-trip and post-trip vehicle inspections. Like that airline pilot, you too should go through a checklist before you put your vehicle on the road. The checklist will help you remember all the important things to inspect, and it will help you to perform the inspection in a logical sequence. After this presentation, and after your next pre-trip inspection, you may need to either add or remove items from the list. You'll be provided with a sample checklist at the end of this presentation. Even Smith, a driver here at the Jaunt System, is going to demonstrate the recommended procedure for checking out a vehicle before taking it on the road. Start by setting the parking brake. Since you're going to leave the driver's seat while the engine is running, you may want to first put chocks under the wheels. Next, follow your company's prescribed procedures for starting the engine. When the engine starts, check the appropriate lights or gauges for sufficient oil pressure, fuel level, and whether or not the alternator is working. If the oil pressure light stays on or the oil pressure is dangerously low, shut off the engine until the problem can be corrected. If the alternator or generator light stays on, the battery may not be charging. That means you could get stranded along the route by a dead battery. Have the problem located and corrected. Check the windshield wipers to make sure they're working and in good order. Also, check the windshield washer to make sure it contains fluid. If you're in a very cold or freezing climate, you may want to inspect the washer fluid's reservoir visually instead. Adjust all of your mirrors so that you have good vision from a normal driving position. Check to make sure your seatbelt works. Not only can it save your life, it also can help keep you behind the wheel during a defensive driving maneuver. Next, tap your horn to make sure it works. Move the steering wheel from side to side and feel for excessive play. Push in on the brake pedal. It shouldn't feel spongy or soft. Make sure the blower fan works so you'll be able to use the heater, defroster, and air conditioner. These accessories can make your trip more comfortable and safer. Turn on all lights. Check the interior lights and illuminated signs to make sure they're working. Leave the lights on, because in a few minutes, we'll check the exterior lights as well. Next, inspect your emergency equipment to make sure it is in place and in working order. Your equipment may include a properly charged fire extinguisher of the correct type, warning devices such as cones, triangles, or flares, a first aid kit, extra fuses, and a flashlight with fresh batteries. Now look around the inside of your vehicle to make sure it is clean and clear of trash, debris, and other unwanted or loose items. A clean vehicle is both safer and a mark of professionalism. If your vehicle is equipped to handle wheelchairs, make sure the equipment is in proper working condition. Tie downs should be examined for damage or excessive wear and aging. Check that all lifts and ramps are functioning properly. Depending on the type of equipment you use, you may have to move the vehicle to ensure proper clearance while performing this part of the inspection. 
Next, make sure all doors are working and emergency exits are unobstructed. Put on the headlight high beams and emergency flashers. Remember, we left the other exterior lights on. With the vehicle parked and the emergency brake still on, start the outside check from the front of the vehicle. If you wish to check engine and washer fluid levels, now would be an appropriate time. Shut the engine off first, however. Check the headlights, signal or emergency lights, and clearance lights to make sure they're working. Look at the left front tire for signs of road damage or underinflation. It's hard to tell just by looking or kicking the tire, so someone should periodically check all the tires with a gauge. An underinflated tire can be dangerous because it flexes when rolling, causing heat, which may cause the tire to soften or lead to a blowout. A soft tire is very susceptible to severe road damage. An overinflated tire is not as dangerous, but can cause a bumpier and less comfortable ride. Your exterior inspection should begin at the front of the vehicle. Move down the left side of the vehicle and around to the front again. By approaching your inspection systematically, you're less likely to overlook something. Move around to the rear of the vehicle and inspect the left rear tire or duals for obvious damage or inflation problems. At the back of the vehicle, check the tail lights, brake lights, turn signals and emergency flashers, and any other clearance lights, reflectors, or signs. Carry a rag with you to clean any mud or dirt from the lights and reflectors. Look underneath for any foreign or unfamiliar objects hanging down or wedged under the vehicle. Also, check for any puddles of fluids. Determine the source of any leak and report it to your supervisor at once. Inspect the right side of the vehicle, beginning with the right rear tire or duals and the right side marker light. If there are any outside signs for your boarding doors or lifts, this is a good time to make sure they're in place and clean. Check the right front tire and the side marker light. You have arrived back at the front of your vehicle and your inspection is nearly complete. If you're not sure or not satisfied with the condition of your vehicle, check with a supervisor before placing the vehicle in service. If you take faulty equipment on the road, you could be asking for an accident, a breakdown, or other problems. You should have a working knowledge of your local vehicle codes and company in-service criteria to help determine whether your vehicle is safe. Once you're satisfied with your pre-trip inspection and you've removed any wheel chocks, you're ready to begin your run. Remember that any problems that arise during your shift should be reported so that repairs or adjustments can be made. A thorough investigation of your vehicle takes only a few minutes and is an important part of your professional obligations. Common sense is also important. Not all conditions or situations can be covered in a single presentation. If you come across a problem we haven't discussed, let common sense and sound judgment be your guides. Professionalism in vehicle inspections will help you reach your goal of safe transportation. Remember, safe transportation is only possible through the use of safe vehicles, and regular and thorough inspections help keep safe vehicles on the road. Thanks for watching. For the Transportation Safety Institute, I'm Nat Benchley. A presentation of the Joint Center for Urban Mobility Research at Rice Center, a nonprofit research corporation affiliated with Rice University.
Transportation Safety Institute of the U.S. Department of Transportation presents the STARTS Training Program, Special Transit and Rural Transit Safety. In this program, we'll look at recommended procedures for defensive and safe driving of special transit and rural transit vehicles. Hi, I'm Nat Benchley, and welcome to the STARTS Training Program. Today, we're at Jefferson Area United Transportation in Charlottesville, Virginia, to look at how you can become a better defensive driver. As every professional driver knows, safety is no accident. Statistics indicate that more than 90% of all accidents can be prevented by safe driving practices. As a professional, you have a responsibility to do everything you can to protect your passengers and other people from accidents. Often, this means using the techniques that will be described in this program. But as always, your own common sense is your most valuable guide to handling most situations. Your goal as a professional is safe transportation, and good driving techniques are an important key to making trips safer and more comfortable for your riders. Let's begin by looking at the starting procedure. Your first step should always be to make a pre-trip safety inspection using a thorough checklist. The complete procedure is described in another program in this series. Engine starting procedures will vary depending on the type of vehicle. Vehicles with automatic transmissions will usually start in either neutral, park, or both. If your vehicle doesn't have a park position, be sure the parking brake is set before starting the vehicle in neutral. When starting a vehicle with a manual transmission, be sure the parking brake is set and the transmission is in neutral before turning the key. When the engine starts, don't let it race or run at high speed until sufficient oil pressure has built up to thoroughly lubricate the motor. If the engine runs continuously at a high speed, shut it off and report the problem. Do not put the vehicle into gear if the engine is racing. One way to make good use of the time it takes to warm the engine is to adjust your mirrors. With your pre-trip inspection out of the way, your mirrors adjusted and your seatbelt fastened, you're ready to start your run. First, let's discuss how to accelerate the vehicle. Keep it smooth. Quick acceleration or jackrabbit starts can jar your passengers, causing discomfort or even injury. Imagine the steering wheel as a clock. Place your hands on the wheel at the nine o'clock and three o'clock positions. Keep both palms around the wheel with the thumbs on top. Never hook your thumbs under the wheel and avoid wearing jewelry that could get caught in your clothes or otherwise restrict movement of your hands on the wheel. Larger vehicles may require hand-over-hand -hand method steering. Pull the wheel in one direction and then return it after the turn is completed. Extra caution is required when you have to back up your vehicle. Your mirrors are of only limited utility because of blind spots. For example, you may be able to see a large vehicle in your mirror, but a small child in the same spot may be hidden from view. If you have to back up your vehicle, and you are not absolutely sure that there are no people or obstacles in your way, put the vehicle in park, set the brake, and get out and take a look for yourself. After you make sure the area behind your vehicle is clear, turn on your emergency flashers. Your vehicle may have a special horn or alarm which sounds when the vehicle is moving in reverse. If not, give short, continuous beeps on the horn while backing. Your mirrors are always valuable defensive driving tools. Remember though, mirrors do have limitations. Your left side mirror usually has a blind spot directly over your left shoulder and directly behind the vehicle. The right side mirror usually has a blind spot directly under the mirror near the front end and directly behind the vehicle. Also, remember that many right side mirrors make objects appear farther away than they really are. Learning to use both your side mirrors is important for professional transit drivers. On a crowded vehicle, your overhead mirror may be of little use other than to check on your passengers. Once underway, you should always be alert to what is going on outside your vehicle by constantly surveying the road. 
First, look in the left mirror, glance in the overhead mirror, check the right mirror, and look straight ahead through the windshield. You should repeat this pattern every 10 to 15 seconds as you drive. When you survey the road like this, be alert to potential hazards, such as a car that is following too close, a delivery van at the curb with its flashers on, a parked car with its engine running, a person on a bicycle or motorcycle, a construction area, pedestrians walking near the street, children playing in the street. Following distance is the distance you should drive behind another vehicle to allow for safe stopping. To establish your following distance, use the 1004 rule. First, note when the vehicle ahead of you passes a point, such as a road sign. Begin counting by saying 1001, 1002, 1003, and 1004. If you pass the same point before reaching the end of your count, you are following too closely. If the vehicle in front of you has stopped, don't move until the other vehicle has moved and you have counted to 1003. This should give you sufficient time to respond if the vehicle in front of you has begun to move and then has to make a quick stop. Under normal conditions, smooth, steady pressure on the brake pedal will usually provide a smooth and safe stop. In emergency stops, reaction time and braking distance are two important considerations. Reaction time is the amount of time between the instant you perceive the need to stop and the moment your foot actually hits the brake. Braking distance is the distance your vehicle travels after the brakes have been applied. Braking distance is affected by the weight of your vehicle, the type of road surface, weather conditions, and the mechanical condition of your braking system. A vehicle going 25 miles per hour will travel more than 27 feet during the three quarters of a second it takes the driver to react. If all brakes are functioning and the road is dry, braking distance after reaction time will be an additional 31 feet for a total distance of 58 feet. At 35 miles per hour, the travel distance during reaction time will be 38 feet. Braking distance would add 61 feet for a total of nearly 100 feet. At 55 miles per hour, Reaction distance goes to 60 feet, and the braking distance goes to 150 feet, for a total stopping distance of 210 feet. On a wet road surface, the braking distance at 55 miles per hour could be as much as 225 feet, for a total stopping distance of 285 feet. A good reason to slow down in wet weather. A final thing to remember, is that if you lock up all the wheels while braking, the tires will slide and you will lose control over the direction of your vehicle. It will slide in the direction momentum and gravity take it. Now let's discuss some common driving situations that you'll encounter on your runs. The key here is to signal your intentions ahead of time. To merge into expressway traffic, signal at least 150 feet before entering the expressway and smoothly pick up speed in the acceleration lane to match the speed of vehicles on the expressway. Once the vehicles in front of you have entered the expressway, check your mirror so that you can enter when there is a sufficient gap to allow you to merge at traffic speed. Use the 1004 rule to re-establish following distance. When changing lanes, Turn on your signal lights at least 150 feet before you want to change lanes. Check your mirror and change lanes smoothly when the area on that side of your vehicle is clear. Don't forget that your mirror has blind spots. Once you've changed lanes, use the 1004 rule to re-establish your proper following distance. When leaving the expressway, signal at least 250 to 300 feet before the exit. Check your mirror. Then move into the exit or deceleration lane as far ahead of the exit ramp as possible. Remember, however, that if you signal too early, 
traffic behind you may assume you forgot to turn the signal off from a previous lane change. Passing another vehicle on a two-lane road can be tricky. If you must pass, make sure you maintain your following distance until you are ready to begin passing. Check to see that there is no oncoming traffic. Check your left mirror, then signal, and smoothly accelerate past the other vehicle. Before pulling back into the lane ahead of the car you just passed, signal your lane change and check the mirror to make sure you have left the other vehicle with sufficient following distance. If you are passed by another vehicle, keep your speed constant. Be prepared to drop back if the passing vehicle cuts in front of you and use the 1004 rule to establish following distance. Curves in the road aren't a problem if you follow some simple rules. Slow to below the posted speed limit, do not brake during the curve, and do not pass if you are on a two-lane road. Intersections, like this one, are probably the most dangerous points on your route. More than one-third of all traffic accidents happen at intersections. When approaching an intersection, slow down and prepare to stop. Obey all traffic lights and signs. Check to the left for traffic, then to the right, then to the left again. At a four-way stop, the vehicle that arrives at the intersection first usually goes first. If there are no signs or signals and two vehicles arrive at the same time, the one on the right usually goes first. But be prepared to yield. Not everyone is familiar with the rules of the road. Like intersections, railroad crossings can be danger points. When approaching a railroad crossing, turn on your emergency flashers. Never assume railroad signals are working. Stop short of the tracks, but close enough to see down the tracks in both directions. Listen for any noise from a warning signal or approaching train. Check each set of tracks before crossing to make sure no trains are approaching. If there's a vehicle in front of you, maintain proper following distance so you don't have to stop on the tracks if the vehicle in front of you stalls. And if your vehicle has a manual transmission, don't risk stalling on the tracks yourself by shifting gears as you pass over the tracks. Finally, your vehicle should have a sign on the back stating that it stops at all railroad crossings. Remember to turn on your headlights before it gets dark. Don't wait until you can no longer see the road. Driving at night requires extra alertness. At night, maintaining sufficient following distance is especially critical. You should always be prepared to stop in that portion of the road ahead of you that is illuminated by your headlights. At dawn, leave your headlights on until the sun has risen above the horizon and the lights can no longer be seen on the road surface. Drive with your brights or high beams on, except when there is a car less than 500 feet in front of you going in the same direction, or a car approaching you within 500 feet. When driving through fog or smoke, you'll see better if you use your low beams. Never stop on the roadway in fog. In bad weather, slow down and increase your following distance two or three times the normal dry weather distance. Clear all frost, snow, or ice off of all windows and mirrors, turn on the defroster, and use your windshield wipers and washers as necessary. The main danger in bad weather is unintentional skidding. There are five things you can do to help avoid unintentional skids. Slow down, accelerate slowly, brake slowly by pumping the brakes, avoid quick changes of direction, and plan ahead. If, in spite of all your defensive driving efforts, your vehicle starts to skid, ease up on the accelerator, avoid using the brakes, and turn the steering wheel in the direction of the skid. For example, if the rear tires start to skid right, turn the vehicle to the right. If the skid is to the left, turn the vehicle to the left. 
In summary, the procedures for safe driving in bad weather are slow down, increase your following distance, turn on your headlights, keep all windows and mirrors clean, use wipers, washer, and defroster as necessary, brake sooner than normal, brake smoothly and easily, and avoid sudden maneuvers. Picking up and discharging passengers can be a special challenge for transit drivers. If you have an established route with fixed zones for loading and unloading marked by signs, it's a good rule of thumb to stop about three feet short of the sign. If there's a curb in the loading area, signal your intentions, then try to stop about six inches off the curb. If you can't get within six inches of the curb, stop at least three feet away from the curb. This will discourage passengers from trying to stretch from the curb to your vehicle while boarding or disembarking. If your regular loading area is blocked, you may have to board and discharge passengers from the street. Any time that you have to discharge passengers into the street, warn them to watch their step. If you do not have a fixed route, or if you handle elderly and handicapped passengers, you'll need to be flexible as to your boarding sites. Leave sufficient space between the wheelchair lift or ramp and the curb to allow room to maneuver. Whenever possible, park in an area that has a smooth and solid surface leading to your vehicle. Moving a wheelchair across a rough or soft surface is not only difficult, it can be extremely dangerous. So far, we've looked at safety equipment and driving techniques, two important areas of concern. But the most critical piece of safety equipment on any vehicle is the driver. So let's look at some things that might affect a driver's performance. Personal problems, fatigue, alcohol and drug use, and illness. Ideally, you should leave your personal problems at home. No one expects you to be able to turn off your feelings like a machine. But you do have a professional responsibility to learn how to deal with your problems so that you can keep your mind on your driving. Adjust your job schedule and lifestyle to ensure that you get enough rest to be alert on the job. You should not drink any alcohol for at least eight hours before coming to work. Under no conditions should you drink alcohol on the job or at breaks. Both legal and illegal drugs can affect your ability and attitude. Consult with your doctor about using any medicines on the job. Of course, the use of illegal drugs at any time is strictly prohibited. For illness, the rules are simple. If you're ill, don't drive. And if you are chronically ill, seek employment that does not require you to drive for a living or as a volunteer. In this program, we've talked about a number of defensive and safe driving techniques. Your next step will be to demonstrate those procedures to your supervisor or other person designated by the company. Using a road training guidelines manual, that person will tell you how you can earn a safe driving certificate. Remember, by using your skills and defensive driving tools, you can build a record of safety to be proud of. Thanks for watching. For the Transportation Safety Institute, I'm Nat Benchley. A presentation of the Joint Center for Urban Mobility Research at Rice Center, a nonprofit research corporation affiliated with Rice University. The 
Transportation Safety Institute of the U.S. Department of Transportation presents the STARTS Training Program, Special Transit and Rural Transit Safety. Hi, how are you doing today? In this program, we'll look at driver sensitivity and passenger relations, two important parts of doing your job. Hi, I'm Nat Benchley, and welcome to the STARTS Training Program. We're at Jefferson Area United Transportation in Charlottesville, Virginia. As a driver providing rural or special transportation, an important measure of your success is how well you deal with your passengers. The keys to good passenger relations are professionalism and common sense. The goal is safe transportation. Professionalism is important because your passengers look to you for direction. On your vehicle, you are the person in charge. Beyond that, it's your professionalism that encourages riders to continue using the system. Common sense is your most valuable tool in dealing with passengers. In some cases, conditions or situations will arise which are not covered in your training. That's when your own good common sense should be your guide. Remember, your goal is safe transportation. Good passenger relations encourage passenger cooperation, and that makes your job as a driver easier. First, let's take a close look at you, the driver. Whether you wear a uniform, everyday dress, or a special t-shirt like they do here at Jaunt, your personal appearance should convey a professional image. When people board your vehicle, your attitude may determine just how pleasant or unpleasant the trip is going to be for you and your passengers. Hi, how are you doing today? I'm okay, how are you? A nice smile and a pleasant hello are always appreciated. If you collect fares, you should be aware of your company's fare collection policy. I know I had some money when I left home this morning. If a passenger has a problem finding the fare or pass, ask him to step aside so that other passengers aren't Excuse kept me. from boarding. Remember, patience demonstrates professionalism. If a passenger can't find the money or pass, follow company policy. Usually, giving the passenger the benefit of the doubt the first time is acceptable. That's okay. We'll take care of it the next time. Thank you. You're welcome. Many passengers will even pay double on the next trip if first given the benefit of the doubt. Be sure all passengers are seated before you move away from each stop. Is everyone buckled up? And if your vehicle has passenger seat belts, remind your passengers to use them. Now let's discuss some of the things that passengers do or say that can cause problems. Keeping a cool head and using common sense are two marks of professionalism in this area. Hey, I've been waiting here for 15 minutes, and now I'm going to be late for my appointment downtown. In a situation like this, you gain nothing by arguing, even if you're running on time. A polite apology and perhaps an excuse such as traffic problems should be sufficient. This bus is filthy. Don't you ever clean these things? As in other cases of passenger complaints, you should offer a polite apology as well as a logical explanation. Well, with all the dust on the road, it's been tough keeping the vans clean. Arguing isn't going to help. She'll probably complain to her friends and maybe even to the company. Dealing with the occasional rudeness of passengers is one of the challenges you face as a driver. Remember, your job is to provide safe transportation. If you let passengers' remarks bother or distract you, you could end up having an accident. So even though you may be tempted to put in your two cents, remember that safe driving is much more important. Let's look at another common problem that you'll meet on the road. Passengers who insist on eating and drinking in your vehicle. In many areas, consumption of food and drink on a transit vehicle is against the law. But even if it isn't a violation, your vehicle is no place for a picnic. If the food or drink spills, it could cause an accident or someone could get burned or soil their clothes. I'm sorry, you have to cover those drinks and wrap those sandwiches until you get off. Your best bet is to ask the passengers to wait. A visible sign clearly stating the company policy or rules on food and drink is a big help. Good morning. Good morning. In most areas, smoking on transit vehicles is prohibited by law. At any rate, smoking should not be allowed on your vehicle. Again, a sign that clearly states company policy can be a real help in dealing with passengers. 
So far, we've limited our discussion to passengers who require minimum assistance. Now let's take a look at passengers who have special needs or present special transportation problems, such as the elderly or the handicapped. Again, professionalism and common sense are your most valuable resources. Many elderly and handicapped people must live with pain on a daily basis. Passengers with arthritis, for example, can suffer considerable pain every time your vehicle hits a bump at too high a speed. If you know a passenger is arthritic, you might find that seating him in the middle of the vehicle minimizes the effect of bumps. Some passengers may use aids for walking, such as a wooden underarm crutch. This type of crutch is generally used by people who are only temporarily disabled, so they are probably inexperienced in its use. Canes, or walkers, are generally used by people who are permanently handicapped. All these passengers have difficulty keeping their balance and move slowly when boarding, finding a seat, and disembarking. And since passengers using canes or crutches have difficulty maintaining balance, they should always be warned before you attempt to assist them. Some of your passengers will be blind or visually impaired. There are about one and a half million legally blind people in the United States, and over five million people are sufficiently visually impaired to make travel difficult. You can usually identify a blind person by a white cane or guide dog. If the blind passenger has a guide dog, try to learn its name for future reference. While most guide dogs are gentle, avoid any sudden or abrupt movements toward either the dog or its master. A blind person's cane is not used for support. Rather, it acts as the blind person's eyes. Blind or visually impaired people generally prefer to sit in seats against the vehicle walls or in seats with armrests. This helps them to avoid falls during sudden vehicle maneuvers. If it is necessary to take the cane for storage, always tell the passenger first. And I'm gonna store your cane. Most blind people are not deaf. Be careful not to shout unnecessarily. If it is necessary for you to lead or escort the blind, there are some specific guidelines you should follow. These guidelines are set forth in your driver's manual. In addition to blind passengers, you may encounter some of the 14 million people in the United States who suffer from significant hearing loss. Even with a hearing aid, some people still have trouble. Their hearing aids amplify all surrounding noises, not just voices. Some deaf people communicate with hand signals and finger spelling. It takes a lot of practice to learn this special language, but simple signs can be learned quickly. Deaf people sometimes listen by reading lips. When communicating with a lip reader, be sure to face the person and speak normally. Do not exaggerate your speech or lip movements. You may also meet passengers who are either speech impaired or have lost their speech entirely. It's a good idea to have a pad and pencil available for the speech impaired as well as the hearing impaired. Go and put your seat belts on, come on. Approximately one and a half percent of our population is classified as mentally retarded. Most retarded people are perfectly capable of providing for their most basic needs. The key to dealing with mentally retarded passengers is to understand that their physical age does not match their mental age. Come on, babe. If your system transports passengers confined to wheelchairs, there are some basic principles you should understand. Place yourself on the downhill side of the chair when going up and down curbs, steps, and ramps. Be especially alert to the possibility of falls or slips in wet, damp, or icy conditions. Never attempt to lift a wheelchair by its arms or wheels. The arms may be removable and come off and lifting by the wheels may cause the chair to spin or to otherwise spill its occupant. Make sure the hand grips are tight and always, repeat always, treat the wheelchair as if it had no brakes. Remember, brakes get out of adjustment easily and may allow the wheelchair to move, causing the passenger to fall. Any time a passenger in a wheelchair attempts to stand, sit, or transfer, the wheelchair should be prevented from moving or tipping. Do not restrain the wheelchair and its occupant with the same belt. If you do use the same belt, an emergency stop may bring the full weight of the chair against the passenger and cause serious or even fatal injuries. 
Let's review some of the key points we've covered. Professionalism is the key to your success. Dealing with your passengers in a professional and courteous manner makes them more comfortable and more confident in your abilities as a driver and encourages them to use the system more frequently. Common sense, along with a few special techniques, should be your basic guide. Keep a cool head at all times. And when a situation arises that isn't covered in this program or your driver's manual, let your good common sense be your guide. Remember that handicapped and elderly passengers require special treatment. And familiarize yourself with the procedures we've looked at here. The last point to remember is that safe transportation is your ultimate goal. Good passenger relations encourage cooperation and allow you to concentrate on your driving. Thanks for watching. For the Transportation Safety Institute, I'm Nat Benchley.